Welcome to Fiat Luke's uh, in Genesis 1-3, God said, let there be light. And later on the New Testament in John 1, 1 John 1-1, 1, 1, uh, it also says God is light. And well, we're Christians, we're Catholics, and we believe that the light of Christ is the way to salvation. And there's just nothing more interesting, more fulfilling than Jesus Christ. And, you know, we're theology yeah. nerds too. <laughs> so... Um, you know, we want to use this podcast to glorify God and uh, to share the Catholic faith, and um, we'll go from there. Um, my name Amen, is Nathaniel man. Ricky, and uh, over here is uh, my friend John Church. Um, <laughs> um, so I think before we start going into uh, themes of why we chose Let There Be Light as our podcast name, I think we should get to know let everybody get to know us. Um, so, John, if you just want to kind of introduce yourself and say uh, who you are, and then you're kind of give us a little snapshot of your faith journey and where you're at and what you're doing in life, and then you can hand it over to me, and I can kind of do the same thing. But, John, take the floor. Thanks, Nathaniel. Sorry, don't mean to interrupt you all the time. Oh, um, you're fine. Yeah, my name's John Church, um, newly married man, just under a month. Um, Congratulations. That's, that's been great. Thank you. Right. Um, I've always taken at least the ideas of religion pretty seriously. I was, for all intents and purposes, raised Catholic. You couldn't call me technically a cradle Catholic, but for all intents and purposes, I was. Um, and I got hyped up about Jesus and the faith uh, through a Steubenville conference when I was a teenager. Then later I fell away into secularism and sin. Um, I came back to Jesus and having a, having a personal, intentional relationship with him. Um, I went to seminary for about half a year. And kind of like a crisis of faith, rather. During that time, I almost became Eastern Orthodox. Um, I was trying to like make sure I was in the right faith and searching for the truth and stuff. But ultimately, I come back. In Rome. Um, and as challenging as being a Catholic is sometimes, um, I'm happy here and I'm going to keep going. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, I, I'm Nathaniel Richards. Um, I am a convert to Catholicism. Uh, I converted in Easter Vigil 2015 is when I came into the church. Uh, I grew up uh, the son of a oneness Pentecostal preacher. Um, so I grew up in oneness Pentecostalism pretty much my whole life. Um, wasn't always a fervent oneness Pentecostal. I mean, my parents divorced uh, pretty much in my early teen years, and I fell away from any sense of knowing, you know, following Jesus or knowing anything about what I perceived to be Christianity. Um, late high school, I kind of had a theophany of sorts and had, you know, a bad experience with drugs, and it really got me into looking for you know god after that and i uh um just started uh reading everything i could c.s lewis chesterton eventually got into the church fathers and stuff but um from reading i kind of got knew i had to be trinitarian because the one is pentecostals weren't um they denied the trinity and from looking into you know trinitarian faith you know you become more increasingly catholic and i didn't immediately jump into Rome. I had a, a history professor who was an Anglican priest. I talked with him a lot. Um, I went to some Anglican services. Um, and then I graduated high school, you know, and, you know, went to RCA once, didn't work out. It didn't, was not very appealing. They just didn't seem to know what they were talking about. I told them I liked Catholicism for monasticism. And they were like, what's monasticism? Um, and it was very discouraging, but, you know, I had some Catholic friends I worked with and then I, through them, I started going to mass again. And then I went through RCA and finally made it into the church. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's mostly my journey. I've been Catholic since 2015. I'm, I'm married, uh, have been for almost two years. Um, I have, uh, eight month year old son, uh, Gilbert Lewis named after Chesterton and C.S. Lewis. And, um, I just love Jesus Christ, and I love theology, and I just want to share my faith. 
Yeah, beautiful. I like like Nathaniel said, like you said, man. You know, sharing the light of Christ. Um, really throughout all of human history, but it seems especially acute in these times. You know, we need the light of Christ because there's a lot of dark darkness. Um, we're rocked with on the highest points lots of scandal in the church right now, and lots of people are reasonably scandalized. Like it might not be right of them to leave the church why they just to not see why they would um i mean so i'm sympathetic i don't agree with it i mean i've yeah. been there um right there's a lot of darkness there's lots of at the height of it there's sexual scandal and all these other things um but then also like we suffer from a lot of bad catechesis and a lot of lukewarm catholicism and we don't shed this more deeper organic understanding of the faith into a lot of a lot of our faith and practice these days and so maybe that's something we're trying to rectify through this podcast we're trying to um for ourselves and for our, any listeners we might be blessed with um kind of just share some some things about the faith that aren't talked about so much and right kind of do it and get deeper enrich our, enrich our understanding yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what I would say is definitely there is, I mean, it's been ongoing for a long time, probably in the history of the church, um, definitely since the uh, the aftermath of the Second Vatican Council. But there's just a, a sense of a crisis of catechesis. Um, I mean, I talk to ex-Catholics all the time and they just don't really seem to know much about their faith and you know you try to you know they might want to come to mass or something and you kind of talk about the precepts of the church and you know needing to you know go to confession once a year and stuff and they're like i haven't been to confession and who knows how long and even when i was you know more of a practicing catholic and you're just you know you're just as someone who loves the sacraments and who you know wants to frequent them as often as you can and it just breaks your heart because it's like wow this is something so many people who are raised with this they just don't care they just really don't know about it. it's hard but it's just yeah. i'm convinced you know from reading and then just you know even though everything i've seen in my still know through my devotions and you know just living a sacramental life that this is you know, this is Christ's truth, and it still has to be shared. So, you know, I want to use the podcast in a, as a way of catechesis, as a way of, you know, spreading devotion, you know, to our Lord and so on. And it's just, that's something I I, I want to do. And, you know, there are other podcasts that, they, you know, they do some of these things, but I feel that a lot of them are reactionary and they deal with church news a lot. And I think, you know, there is a place for dealing with church news, but it's just like, I don't know. The faith endures even after the headlines have faded away. So yeah, I think that's what we we need to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, lots of Catholics leave the church and they never, for various reasons, you know, sometimes they're in the right direction, sometimes they're in the left direction. But um, yeah, there's such a depth to the faith and an intentionality, um, you know, some people just leave because they never quite understood what it was about and they find something else that makes more sense, whether it's um, not having a faith or some more exotic Eastern religion, or maybe it's maybe they read the Bible and they're inspired by the Bible and they see Christ in that, but they don't see how the Bible matches the church. Um, yeah. So they, 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 they leave the church because they can't recognize the the scripturalness of the Catholic Church. But um, speaking for myself, through my own study of the Bible and history, there's so much, there's so much there. Um, it's amazing how, you know, in my own, in my own experience, lots of people, like I even had a conversation this last, last week about um, speaking to what I might think is, an, who I might guess is the next Catholic, but she's some kind of, evangelical she's someone from work um we mm -hmm. started talking about faith and um when i told her i was catholic she she said i don't mean to be 
rude to you. I respect you, but to me, the Catholic Church is a pagan religion. <laughs> you straight <laughs> up used the word. You straight up used the p word, pagan. Um, yeah. And I, I told her that you know, I don't think she bought it. God bless her, whatever. Um, yeah. I told her that the Catholic Church isn't so much pagan as much as it's ancient. It it we have a very modern way of understanding things that's divorced from our human roots you know um Mm -hmm. we might some cat or some some not just protestants but some nominal catholics might be scandalized at the idea of like kissing a cross or bowing before a statue or something like that but you know in the ancient world you would have known that not every bow or not every kiss is a sign of worship exactly right right and so it's not so much pagan as it is old and um and as far as how it relates to the Bible goes, um, if you read the Bible with a historical text or historical lens and you actually like, you look at what it says and pay attention to every word, not just not just the ones that console you or not just the ones that are easy to understand. Or your proof um, text. You look at what it yeah. says and you look at the real, if you actually look at the nuance in the language and like once you see them and see where they lead, um, Catholic conclusions are pretty inescapable. Right. I mean, I agree. Um, because, you know, I mean, I mean, I'll put it this way. Again, I was the son of a oneness Pentecostal preacher. Um, you know, even though they deny the Trinity and stuff, they have a lot of Protestant principles. Um, definitely a sola scriptura uh, approach to where everything comes from our Bible. And it was usually, you know, uh, you know, Protestant canon, obviously, but 66 books, KJV, King James Version, and, mm-hmm. you know, that was the Bible, and that's, you know, everything comes from this this book, you know, bonded leather, golden gilded pages, you know, it just almost seems like a magical book, and you know, okay, these are God's words, It'll, and, it, you know, yes, it, in inerrant word of God, good, um, but I grew up, you know, for almost 18 years of my life, trying to read the Bible, trying maybe always giving up, you know, you know, maybe reading some portions of the New Testament. I don't know if I finished it all, but I know I definitely gave up in the Old Testament, especially through the Torah, but I was a preacher's son, you know, and I never actually read the Bible in entirety or, or actually tried to find out what it actually said for myself. I always took, you know, the preacher's word for it or whatever. Um, but, you know, once I had start having, you know, this conversion experience when I was actually trying to actively seek out things and actually trying to cut my teeth on some theology to see what I really believed about, you know, God. I mean, I read the Bible for myself, you know. I did the Protestant canon once all the way through, and then not too long after that, I ended up getting a uh, Catholic Bible and just so I could read the deuterocanonical books that Protestants had taken away. And, you know, I just read the that whole Catholic canon through that second time. And, you know, especially like the Book of Wisdom, I'm like, I don't know why this was taken out. But I was just, I was reading it, and it's like, there's just no way that by myself I can necessarily make the theological conclusions of, you know, Calvin, the Reformers, or even, you know, what I see to be Catholicism, but there's not an actual, you know, magist Darial authority, you know, a teaching authority there. And it, honestly, everyone has a teaching authority, wh- whether you're Reformed or, you know, Catholic or Orthodox or whatever. But it just came down to the point where it's like, I'm reading this Bible. I know it's true, but there are a million ways to see all these proof texts that everyone's throwing at me. And it's like, right. I can see it half a dozen different ways. I can see it from the reform point of view. I can see it from the Catholic point of view. I can, you know, maybe see it from the Orthodox point of view. But it's just like there has to be a point where it's like, you know, you can say scripture interprets scripture, and in a sense that's true. That you know, prophecies fulfill things in the Old Testament, and or I mean, prophecies in the Old Testament fulfill things in the New Testament, and so on. And types and archetypes and all that stuff is true, but scripture doesn't give us doesn't say these are the infallible list of books that comprise God's word. And when it came to, you know, it's just like, I believe everything, you know, the Bible is God's inerrant word, but it's just like, 
and you know you have to make a choice about where the church is i guess because you know the bible alone at the end of the day wasn't enough in the sense of i can't start my own church and i believe when you look at history i mean the church fathers and so on i mean they knew that you couldn't start their own church um right and that everything was received it's like we receive this canon we don't necessarily just codify it and say whatever but it's like no we receive it we we don't just uh manufacture it you know this canon of 73 books comes to us um you know and you know that's kind of how it is and that's what i believe history kind of shows and it's just to me without without the magister the perennial magisterium of the catholic church without you know that you know without the church fathers without um you know the ancient apostolic liturgies i don't know it's just like you exist in this vacuum and it's just mm -hmm. like you know chesterton you know people use this quote all the time but chesterton talked about a democracy of the dead and it just seems that you know our forefathers in faith you know there is there's there is a sensum fide a census of the faith you know there is you mm -hmm. know a cloud of witnesses and it's just like there is a consensus yes there are finer points of doctrine and you know doctrine has developed but i don't know it's just like survey says catholicism um sure but and, you, you can go ahead john yeah and honestly when you look at it too um the census fide like you said you know because they receive the faith you know like the bible itself says faith comes through hearing Exactly. Um, and, you know, like, Christ commanded his disciples to go out and teach all nations. Like, there's this very active ministerial role, um, active pastoral role, in how the faith and the truth of Christ is communicated. Um, it was, it's that faith that makes the church, you know? Like, like, like it's that faith that makes the church. Um, those who believe what Christ taught through his apostles. And, you know, yeah, ultimately, like, I think you're right that um, the early church gives us gives us this list of books that we have. Um, there were occasionally some disputes and about what the canon constituted. And exactly, to yeah. Be, to, to be fair, like, I think a lot of scholars would know that um, um, where the church fathers actually seem to be leaning more in favor for the Protestant canon. That was from Jewish influence, contemporary Jewish influence, not not pre messianic Jewish influence, but um so that that that's kind of letting the synagogue into the church in a way. And that's probably not the way to do things if if the old covenant's been fulfilled. But um It was definitely after Jesus. But right, but like the whole thing is though, even if you had some variation in the canon yeah, at the beginning, yeah. um even if you had some variation of the canon in the beginning, you know what? What I think is so amazing about it is people still had the same faith, even if they had slightly different canons. And for me, like, yeah, I mean, a lot same of the, world, a lot of yeah. the world is opposite of that. It seems like, like, um, you can have like for them, it seems you can have the same canon, but you're not going to interpret it the same way. You're going to have different opinions on whether Jesus was God or not, when he was God or when he wasn't. <laughs> um, or, you know, does baptism save? How many sacraments are there? Does sacraments do anything? Yeah. 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 So, um, whereas you might have had some small variation in the early church about which books are actually in the Bible, but they yeah. all more or less believe the same thing. And, like, you can't say that with the diversity of Christianity that exists now. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, denominationalism. Um yeah, um, you know, I I think one thing, too, is there needs to be an apologia that's not just, that's not just Roman Catholic 
in the sense of like Catholic answers is like, yeah, you want to know what the catechism says? We'll tell you. But it's just like there needs to be an apologia that's one kind, uh, two thoughtful, three prayerful, and then finally uh, um, just unapologetic in the sense of I am Roman Catholic. And, you know, you know. Vatican II had some thoughts and meditations about what it was to be in the church, but you know, in a in the long run, you know, it's like I'm I'm with most of the church and so on. That you know, outside of the church, there is no salvation, no matter what the Abu Dhabi statement says or whatever. It's like God came down to earth as incarnate as a man, Jesus Christ. Died, mm-hmm. died and rose again for our sins so we could live with him, gives us his body and blood to to eat, um, and without this bread you have no life in you. Um, this reality that's the church is like, if you're not in it, brother, you better get in it. Um, you know, you know, and I believe that's that's what the missionary spirit is. It's, it's, you can, yeah, to a point you can accompany, you can dialogue, but it's just like, it's no come come to the bark of peter come be safe don't be on a piece of driftwood um jesus christ yeah. is the way of salvation and i think there's ways to be yeah kind thoughtful and prayerful about it but it's just like you still have to be firm and unapologetic about it in your apology for the faith and that's definitely my approach and take on catholicism is you know, I, I'm there with Protestants or other non-Catholics, um, whether they are Christian or not. But it's just like you still have to be firm and say, no, I, I know in whom I have believed. And, and I know that the church's sacraments are salvific. And it's, so it's like, I got to do my best to show you how God can save your soul. And, you know. In a way, it's how I save my own soul is sharing my faith with others in this way. Um, but you can, yeah, go ahead, John. Oh, no, I didn't have any. Uh, anything anything uh, further? You're, you're kind of saying it all. Um, but yeah, we're, I mean, maybe the first episode isn't the first episode that we should open the can of worms of Dare We Hope. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't I mean, want to go in that can of worms. No, no, but um, I will say though, you know, yeah, yeah, you know, it, it's been a, it's been excellent within the tradition to recognize things like baptism by desire, baptism by blood, um, and then you know, like invincible ignorance, like some of the popes have said, um, yeah. and like while we can grant all that. Like I don't have anything against that either. Like especially if that's what the church teaches. But I mean, well, exactly. if you look at if you have it real, if you look at it realistically, I mean, those those things all make it less likely to be saved rather than more likely. Yeah. Um. And so, um, like, if you if you if you had a whole meal on your hands. And you were passing by someone on the street, and they said they were hungry, and they had a little bit of something there, you know. But they, you recognized what they were. They weren't they weren't well fed, you know. Like, would you give them what you had, or would you say uh, God will take care of them? Like, they don't have enough there. But I mean, go, like they go, have go something. They have something. Like, but like, is it enough? Right. You know, there's that principle from the epistle of James, you know, be warm and be filled. Um, it's like, no, it's like, you know, I will show you my faith by my works. You know, it's like, right. And, you don't know, say, go, yeah, don't don't say be warm and be filled. But I mean, like, if you want to interpret that spiritually, like the faith, the bread of life, I mean, yeah. Like, like don't, yeah, it's, don't just don't just don't just wish your brother well, like feed him. Like and if we're gonna and if we believe yeah. that the, that the Eucharist is the body and blood of Christ and that it's only it's only it's only in the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith where that really happens in its fullness and entirety. Exactly. Like, like, don't just 
we can't just tell our Protestant brethren, okay, yeah, like, go and be filled. Or... <laughs> it's exactly what it's yeah it's like we can't do that it's like um it's like you should be that you know little voice of contention it's like i respect where you're at and so on but it's just like you know it's like we need more than wonder bread or saltine crackers and grape juice it's like we need used bread and wine which once consecrated will substantially change into the body blood of christ it's you know we need the real presence and so on and so forth. Um, and it's like, that's something, you know, you always have to just give witness to. And as, you know, it, Peter says in his epistle, you know, do that with humbleness and, you know, with meekness and fear, you know, sh- you know, sharing the hope that's in you. And, and that's, that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, um, you know, it is definitely never go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it is true that, um, but when people want to stress that, like, we got to love those people, they're not wrong either. Like, like Paul says, like, you know, I, I can have faith so as to move mountains, speak with tongues of men and of angels, or, you know, but if I have not love, I am nothing. And, like, it's true that when we talk to people and try to evangelize them, they're not just, they're not just walking robotic receptacles of information that they have to exactly. process accordingly. They're, they're they're actually human beings. They're the people we love, and we gotta, we do have to communicate it in that way. Like we have to do it for them and not for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that we're not. Um, and you know the the whole thing too is, you know, like if it's the faith that saves, you know, you can't give what you don't have. I mean, you're they're not gonna. You're not going to listen to a Catholic probably who doesn't practice his faith as he should. You know, who isn't living in the grace of God, yeah. you know, being in a state of sanctifying grace and actually pursuing God. I mean, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Got to walk the walk um, and talk the talk. Um, you know, I, I think, I think more than anything, yeah, it's just like be unapologetic, do all these things, but, you know, we can't, you know, and it's hard because it, you just, you can't be dour, you can't be sour. You have, you have to, by walking the walk, by living your faith, there should be a natural joy and a natural fervor oh, yeah. that springs up within you that people yeah. will want, or at least inquire about, you know, and it's like, you know, you know, they'll be like, why do you go to mass every Sunday? Why, you know, why do you not, you know, you know, why why do you not use birth control or something like? I mean, they're gonna ask these questions, and you can take that opportunity to be like, well, you know, because I believe so and so that the scripture and the church have taught such and such and so on. But you don't have to always, oh, you heathen, or be a bullhorn preacher about it. But yeah. you you are called to step up to the plate and say. You know, Paul the Six says this in Humana Vitae. You know, uh, I think it's was it Pius the Eleventh, Coste Canubi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Coste yeah. Canubi. Pius and I mean, I, you got it. yeah. But yeah, it's just like those things. The, you know, the encyclicals. You know, you can talk about Onan and Genesis. You can talk about Church Fathers. But you know, it's just like whatever the subject is, if it comes up, you can joyfully. But firmly and unapologetically, just kind of talk about it, and you know, just there you go. Um, I guess trying to pivot here. Um, let's just talk about uh, Fiat Lux. You know, let right. there be light, Absolutely. and uh, you know, um, maybe meditator kind of talk about that motif, and you know, bring out some passages of scripture. Um, that will help kind of inform the whole theme of our entire podcast and the episodes to come and just kind of be our, uh, be our, but what we want the name to be. And, and, uh, just, this is kind of our, uh, our foundation. So John, if you just kind of want to take from here and talk about what scripture says, uh, I'm happy to hear you. Sure. So we're reading out of the RSV. Highly endorse. Um, when I was in seminary, uh, that was um, I was pretty blessed. Our uh, my 
scripture teacher my first year in seminary was Tim Gray, Dr. Tim Gray of the Augustine Institute, and he knows his stuff. Um, anyway, he likes this Bible, too. That's his mm-hmm. choice of reference. Anyway, so, um, Fiat Luke, let there be light. These are the very first words God utters in all of scripture. Um, fiat lux, let there be light. Um, and it says that before then, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the spirit was moving over the face of the waters. Then God says, let there be light. And there was light. Um, you can parallel this with John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that were made, all things were made through him. And without him was not anything that was made, not, was not anything made that was made. So, you know, like, the Word exists in God from all eternity. Um, you know, he has his Word and his reason. But in the act of creation, God speaks. Like, so... When he says, let there be light, that is Christ, that is Jesus, the Son of God, not yet incarnate, but that is that is God speaking, God breathing forth, the, the earth is created. You know, the creation is made, the universe is made. Mm-hmm. Um, like, like, this is, like, the light is the temporal effect of the eternal word. Because God made all things through the whole, through the God the Father made all things through the Son in the Holy Spirit. Right, Trinitarian um, theology. Yeah. Right. Um. Right. That kind of goes back with what you were saying too. I mean, I know, I know, Jehovah's Witnesses will kind of abuse that first verse of John, but how can you say the Word was with God and the Word was God and that kind of Mm-hmm. Not see how that at least implies a trinity. But, um, yeah, it, John continues, in him was life, and, and, that, and the life was the light of me. Overcome it. Um, Could you uh, repeat that, John? It kind of cut out on you. Oh, yeah, no problem. So, speaking of the word that was with God and was God, in him was life, and the light was the light, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Sweet, sweet. Um, And later on it says, the true light that enlightens every man was coming into the world. Um, I think we can understand that two ways. I think... Um, you can understand that both in the way of um, when it says every, every every you know one of the teachings of the church is that the law of God is written on the human heart. We call that natural law. As Catholics, we know like um, you don't have to be Catholic. You can be an you can be an Hindu or whatever. You know that stealing is wrong. You know killing is wrong. You know that cheating on your wife is wrong. You don't specifically that those things are wrong. That's the law of God being written on the human heart. That's natural law. So the light, the true light that enlightens every man, you know, that natural law comes from Christ the same. It's still the same. So you can say that you can literally take the word every literally there. Like literally enlightens every man. Um, but then you can also... You can also take that a step higher, saying that, like, this is the true light that enlightens every man, as in uh, the potentiality of being enlightened, not just with something natural, but with something supernatural, the supernatural light of the Holy Spirit. Like, it's God who raises us out of the darkness of sin and doesn't only let us see things by natural law, but by divine revelation, by the revealing of his own self, like the uncreated light. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, you know, and it's just, you know, uh, scripture says, you know, I mean, I believe it's God, the father speaking, but this is like my word comes out from me, goes out from me and it co- does not return to me void. 
You know, right. there in the beginning, God speaks everything into existence. And yes, he's the word by which everything is made is made. But from all eternity, God, this universe, you and me, our souls, our eternal souls, our, our whatever, everything was envisioned in the mind of God through the word in Jesus. So um, without God's word, without it, um, this plan of salvation of God, you know, seeing that the fall is a potential, potential outcome, providing us the victory um, in Jesus Christ and, and so on, that there was something about, you know, uh, fallen and redeemed man that was better than a pre-fallen man that right, yeah. God would condescend and do this become one of us but this was something which happened in the beginning but was a whole story in and of itself that came and didn't come back void you know it, it's you know, it's like God is, definitely is this mind um, that's not willy-nilly. God is intentional in everything that he mm -hmm. does. And he, you know, I mean, I think Thomas Aquinas said we are most like God in our, you know, that we can reason. You know, we have rational souls. You know, right. rather than animal souls. Yeah, but God was very, you know, thoughtful. You know, you know what? What does the psalmist say? Uh, you know, what is man that you, you know, what you should think of him? What is man that you know? That you should be mindful of him. Yeah, mindful of him. Yeah, it's just like, but you know, God was mindful of us. He created us, and you know, He provided, you know. Jesus Christ to be the balm for our souls so that we might uh, live with him forever. Um, but this word is the true light that now shines, as the prologue of John says. And then you go even to the letter of First John, you know, you know, John says again, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And, he, you know, he says that after that whole thing in first john where he's like you know what we have seen what we have looked upon what our hands have handled concerning the word of life that this you know god becoming man in jesus and all that it doesn't contradict reason it's because we're using our reason it's because you know doing such empirical things and observations as touching you know the crucified and risen christ putting your hand in his uh, pierced side or his you know pierced nail pierced hands you know seeing what has happened in the resurrection of christ and knowing that he is truly the light of the world and you know salvation and so on it's not just a blind faith but it's a faith that sees but you know god's word um can be handled it can be touched it can be experienced and you know just you know i think it's through this, you know, a sacramental life as a Catholic, um, you know, especially with the Blessed Sacrament and the other sacraments, that, you know, you can truly encounter the risen Lord. And it's not just all theory in your mind. Um, it's not just my, you know, my faith or intellectual ascent alone. It's my faith plus, you know, the uh, cooperating with God's grace and, you know, the spiritual and corporal works of mercy and, you know, responding to the call that he's given in our lives. And, you know, there's just much more than fideism, obviously, but um, the faith is meant to be lived out and the faith is meant to be encountered. And that happens in a personal, sacramental, intentional relationship with Jesus Christ, which I believe, you know, only Catholics can truly have in fullness. Um and, but it's that light of Christ that we have experienced, we have touched, we have handled, we have looked upon, you know, and, and especially in the sacrament of the Eucharist, we have tasted, you know, we have eaten, we have drank of, um, that I believe 
we have to share with others. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah that, John. It is. It is personal. Like it isn't just theory. I know that. Um, doesn't just it. It isn't just a fideism where it's like, okay, now that I've done this, um, now that I've done this, like X Y Z, like I, like now that I've done this, taking communion to X, that means Y, like like now I'm good with God. Like it's way deeper and more interactional and more um more intentional than that. Like it really makes us better. Like it really gives us strength. It really really feeds our souls and helps us to live virtuously. It's not just a sentiment. Like, God actually gives us the grace, the grace that comes from himself in that sacrament. All right. right. Um, I was also going to say earlier, I love the fact that you brought up um, my word comes forth from me and, and does not return to me fruitless. You know, like, you can think of Christ's incarnation in the womb of the Blessed Virgin as it coming out issuing forth and then christ ascending into heaven as as it returning to him and you know it's true it doesn't doesn't come back fruitless like what did we get out of that we got the holy spirit coming upon the church out of that mm-hmm. like right. we got that is the biggest fruit you could have like, like and now now the church itself and um Really, all of humanity, in a way, because they've been redeemed by Christ and His precious blood, and by His. Right. Uh, um, but in, in a more particular way, um, the church, and specifically the elect, um, mm-hmm. they are the true fruits, the truest and ripest fruits of Christ's redemption. Like that is the that is the fruit that God's word returning to Him has brought. All right. Exactly. The church, yeah. Church, um, yeah. We are we are we are the fruit of his victory. We are the we are the fruit which um I mean please God, we as in you and I too, but like we as the church, like that's the that's sorry, my phone's going off. That's, that's the fine. fruit that um that God's God's word reaped in returning to him. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I think all this is good stuff. I mean, obviously we could, you know, chew on it more and more. But, you know, basically God's light should inform everything that we are and do. It should inform our intellect. It should inform our will, everything we are, um, and should act in our lives to be God's presence in the world to others. Um, But, you know, that's what I want, you know, you know, kind of our vision and the foundation for our podcast to be, uh, especially— um, yes, we're going to cover a lot of theological subjects, you know, church fathers, doctrinal disputes, ecumenical councils. We'll talk, a, we'll maybe do some devotional things too, but it right. all is informed by the light of Christ. It's not, you know, it's not just, you know, us sitting here w- wanting to read from a theology manual or, you know, just wanting to bore you. It's just like, it's like all this stuff that may seem boring, or is this like it, sh- it, it can only be found maybe in a in a textbook or whatever. It's like all this stuff has practical applications. It's like church history, actual dogma and doctrine, the creeds. It's like it's not just dry stuff. It's like it has vibrancy. It has life. It and it is all part of you know the history of God's people, the church. But the church has life, and she is still one holy Catholic and apostolic, despite all the weirdness and strangeness and the bad stuff that's happened. And, you know, you still have to live out that reality. And so it's just like, you know, God envisioned us at creation, you know, through his son Jesus, the word by which everything was made, and especially in the Paschal mystery, you know, accomplishing our salvation. Um, God said, let there be light, and it's that light— you know, which comes only in the uh, the risen Jesus, that the crucified and risen Jesus, that we have to share. We have to share the Lord with others, and that's what I want for this podcast. Any, any thoughts with that, John? Yeah, um, more scripture. 
Um, but it ties in well with what you're saying, right? Everything we have to do has to be done in the light of Christ. It's the only way that it's the only way that um, anything we do is going to have a value in eternal life is if we do it with, in, and through Christ. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it it really is intimate. Like, we really are Christ's instruments. Like, you know, some people interpret the light of Christ being the Holy Spirit himself, but, um, you know, like, not not in all cases, but like, like, you know, where he says, you know, he says in John's Gospel... I am the light uh, that I am the light of the world. He who believes in me yeah. shall not walk in dark, uh, darkness, but shall have the light of life. Well, he means that like he is the light of the world, um, and that yeah. walk, and his, walking in his ways brings light into people's lives. Um, in Saint Matthew's Gospel, though, he what does he say? He says, "You are the light of the world." Yeah. Um, as in, like Christ works his light through us. Yeah, like, like like we are his instruments in the world. Like we're, we're supposed to be his hands and feet, his servants, his slaves, um, his instruments. So yeah, we have to ha- we have to ourselves be subject to his reign because he's Christ the King. We have to ourselves render our bodies and our minds and our wills as holocaust to him. Um that his light shines more deeply in us and that it in turn will pierce through the darkness in other people's lives. And so, yeah, I agree with you that, um, yeah, the whole theme of this is really kind of a spiritual one. Um, we're discussing theology and devotions and everything like that. But the idea is to really root ourselves in the light of Christ. Yeah. 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 Because without him, there's darkness and, you know, Darkness is not of God, you know. Right. Um, um, St. Augustine notes that um, in the creation narrative, um, when it says God separated the light from the darkness, the darkness is the only thing that God never said was good. Right. Yeah, that's 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 especially true. Um, you know, I think just in a way to kind of maybe wrap up this introductory um, get to know you episode, um, yeah, you know, maybe we should just uh, go ahead and close with you know uh, a few prayers. Um, maybe just do uh, maybe one Our Father, um, and then one Hail Mary, and then a Glory Be. And do you know the uh, We adore Thee, O Christ, and we praise Thee from the station of the cross? I do, I do. I guess I pray that a lot, but um, I, do, I do too, actually. So that's cool. Yeah. But, you know, that's, I think that's a good, uh, as St. Francis de Sales calls it, a good little spiritual bouquet um, to offer up. Um, you know, definitely directing all our adoration to the triune God, of course, but then also asking the Theotokos, you know, uh, God's mother, Mary, just to pray for, you know, the se- success of this little uh, venture we're doing, but also uh, that, you know, God's light would shine in our lives, that the light of her son, the, who was the eternal Logos of uh, God the Father would truly be present in our deliberations, but in our lives. Um, so, does that sound good for you? Yeah. Pray that we um, we pray that we that this podcast, but really everything we do in our lives, might be pleasing to God and might have His light shine upon us in it. Okay. Right. All right. You let you can lead. This is kind of this whole thing was kind of your idea, so I'll let you lead. All right, all right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. 
as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We adore thee, O Christ, and we praise thee, because by thy holy cross thou hast redeemed the world. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, well, that's a good start. Um, yeah, again, thanks, buddy. Yeah. I'm, uh, you know, we'll, we'll stop recording after this, but we'll probably talk a little bit on the, on the call more. But um, I'm Nathaniel Richards, and you are? I'm John Church. Let me say it five and more times. this is Fiat Luke's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, but this is Fiat Luke's, and just stay tuned because there will be more uh, episodes. God bless y'all.